So I want to welcome someone who knows more about silver than anyone else on the planet. He's David Morgan, the silver guru, and my fiance calls him the silver fox. <laughs> welcome, welcome, David. Oh, Elio, thank you. And I don't know if I know any more than anyone. I've certainly studied as hard as, you know, maybe the top 10 people. But anyway, thanks for having me. It's going to be fun. So this podcast is about finding undervalued early stage assets and getting in early uh, before a steep rise in prices. So my question for you is, do you believe silver is an undervalued asset in the early stages of a bull run? Yeah, that's sort of tough to answer. First part is very easy. Is it an undervalued asset? Yes. I mean, that can be proven in multiple ways. If you go back to, uh, let's say, when um, a lot of people actually started becoming aware of silver as an investment around the bottom, around the 1999 time frame. Why is that? The reason being that Warren Buffett, well-known investor and followed by many, either deliberately or at a cursory level, bought 130 million ounces of silver. He bought it off the COMEX primarily. In fact, I think all of it. And it shot the price higher. And it got a lot of people to wake up and you know say, hmm, what's he doing about silver? What's interesting, and I'm going to get to your question, Elliot, is he's a value investor. So he bought it at around roughly he bought it in tranches but usually under the five dollar level just under so we'll call his average price five and what's interesting is that after he did the purchase and it was announced publicly forbes magazine did a whole expose on the silver market and they put out a chart of the inflation adjusted price of silver and I use that in lectures from time to time. In fact, for a while, I was using it in almost all of my lectures. And if you go back in history and you take the, you know, basically what would be the constant price of silver, which means it varies in paper terms, but it's constant as far as inflation is concerned. So you take the inflation lie out of it. And you see silver as high as like $1,477, okay? So a lot of people say, well, you know, my statement that silver will make it to 100 sounds rather you know, crazy. I mean, it's only made it half that far. But if you go back and what it actually was worth in an inflation-adjusted basis, it's already been in the over $1,000 place. Yeah. So the point is simple. That inflation-adjusted chart showed that Warren Buffett was buying silver at the lowest price in recorded history. How's that for value investing? I, I can see Warren Buffett timing it like that. Yeah. yeah. So at that point, a lot of people woke up. So now where are we? Well, actually, if you take the monetary base and you adjust it to silver, even though, let me back up slightly. So when he bought it, it was $5, but you could go, well, wait a minute, David. I know that silver was 22 cents in the Great Depression. So 22 cents is a lower number than $5. And the answer is correct mundo in nominal terms. But remember what I said, we're taking the lie out of the equation and we're making it a level playing field for everybody to see the truth. And the truth is the true price adjusted, which means a dollar in 1300 is the same as a dollar today. And of course, yeah. that's not true because of inflation, but we're going to make our, our graphs show that. So if you do that, then $5 in 1999 was less valuable than 22 cents was in the Great Depression. So if we do that same math, we find out that today silver is cheaper than it was when Buffett bought it. Wow. Yeah. And that's just crazy. So if you do look at an inflation adjusted silver chart, it's kind of back where it was almost a hundred years ago. Yeah. Right. So right. It is out of control. So it's uh, okay. So it's undervalued. Right. So, <laughs> uh, well, and the other part I'm going to interrupt because I'd like to answer questions is, you know, is it like you, the other part was about timing and, you know, I mean, that's, that's always the answer, right? I mean, timing is everything, especially in a fast moving market. And so what I could say is one, you're buying it, even though it's at $28 adjusted for inflation, you're buying it very near where Buffett bought it. Secondly, well, yeah, but Buffett bought it in 1999. We're doing this interview in 2021. We're talking about 22 years ago, my friend. So, you know, and I have an answer for that. And the answer is that in all markets, you see this huge move up in what's called the third leg. 
And the third leg is where I made the expression. Basically, it, it, I heard it first from uh, CPM Group, Jeffrey Christian, that 90% of the move comes in the last 10% of the time. And so it <laughs> makes sense. And I did the quick arithmetic in 1980, and it's true. Uh, and those are approximations. I mean, the math, the way I, I chose the starting point and the end point was 87.5% of the move came in the last 7% of the time. So January 1979 to January 1980. So the idea is this. I think we're in that lake. I think it started at the $12 bottom in March of last year, almost a, a year ago from when we're doing your interview. And so we've gone from 12 to 28, 28 to 56, 56 to 100 and you know, whatever that is, 112, 112 to 224. I don't know if it's going to, I think it'll double, redouble and double again. And we'll double beyond that. I don't know. And remember, an ounce of silver is an ounce of silver. So silver hasn't changed. What has changed is the price around it and the value of it, meaning, you know, silver can only buy you, um, you know, whatever, what's $20 by these days or $30 by these days. Um, five gallons, six gallons of gas, you know, we'll buy you 60 gallons of gas or 600 gallons of gas. Now we know it's getting overvalued. So, so that's, that's the second part. Yeah. Okay, great. So then I agree with you. It's undervalued. So then the question is, you know, how to take advantage of this early stage bull market and potentially maximize returns to get to that life changing return that, um, that we're looking for. Yeah. Well, that's, that is the question again. And first of all, you know, in the long scheme of things, I mean, as you said, I've studied silver and gold pretty hard. So in the, in the long term, gold and silver preserve wealth. So in most cases, especially for gold, it doesn't make you wealthy. It's like, okay, I've got that ability to buy that six gallons of gas, 10 years from now, still six, 60 years from now, still six, 600 years from now, still six, that kind of thing. However, there are times, and they're rare, in monetary history where the metals themselves will overshoot in value substantially due to a currency crisis. And that's what we're facing. So I think the asymmetric gains are possible. Just because I think that, I've studied it, I can lecture and argue on it, doesn't mean it's going to be true. But everything's lining up for it to become true. So we can see silver again, particularly more than gold, because silver is so one misrepresented on its true value right now and secondly it's affordable for almost everybody and lastly it's education it shows like yours elliot that more and more people say wait a minute and then they start to do a little bit of research on their own they verify you know for themselves exactly what's going on in the silver market and how easy it is i mean the thing about silver and gold is you don't need a brokerage account you don't need a counterparty you know, where you're at in California, I mean, there's, there's probably six dealers within uh, 60, 70 miles where you're sitting right now that you can walk in with, uh, you know, fiat Fed notes from uh, that private banking cartel and exchange it yeah. for real money. So, you know, there's that. And you don't need any uh, special sign your stock certificate and, you know, verify everything to sell it back. You know, the only time you have... Uh, let's say an issue is if you're doing it in over 10,000 quote unquote dollars, 10,000 worth of currency. So it's actually one of the most easily uh, obtained and easily um, sold items that you can. And it's basically anonymous for the most part, if you want it to be. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's great. I mean, the physical trade is, uh, is another way to maximize returns. Right. And, and I like what you've said actually before, just to go on a side tangent about how, like, I've heard you say voting with your wallet, right? Yeah. Because it's, <laughs> I mean, to me, it seems like a no brainer. If, if silver is almost at the bottom historically, and you were to transfer in your fiat printed money into it now, and there's nowhere really for it to go, and it seems like every dip is a buying opportunity, why not kind of transfer money over into the hard asset and take it out of the fiat? So, right, I mean... Yeah, I think the main thing is just to balance it with, you know, your your goals, short term and long term. A lot of people hear the silver and gold story and they get very enthused and they kind of go overboard. Now, it's best to do a long term perspective. What's long term at your age is probably shorter than at my age. But the point being, 
you really don't want to look at it as, you know, I bought it now and next week, it better be a lot higher because I put everything I own in the silver. That's not the way to approach the market. It's to, you know, become a stacker, buy a hundred dollars worth, you know, a hundred dollars in currency every month or 50 or whatever you can afford. Maybe it's 500. I don't know. It's varies person to person and take a longer term view. And then when it starts to accelerate, do what's never taught. And that is you load up once the market has proven to you that it's going to go higher. So, for example, if silver goes over 30, 33 and stays there for three, four days in a row and the volume is extremely high and all of a sudden the L.A. Times comes out and says silver is on a run or whatever, even though you're buying it at a new high, it's going to go a lot higher. It's sort of like when Bitcoin broke out, right? When Bitcoin finally got above 17,000, which was the old high, let go to 50, 55,000 pretty quick. That's how markets work. Yeah. Silver being unique and affordable will, I'm not saying it's going to do what Bitcoin does, but the curve will look similar. It'll be a, a rocket ship. Yeah, so I did want to ask you, I think the exchange rate is like, 2100 physical ounces to to one bitcoin so question is would you rather have 2100 beautiful physical ounces of silver that's a lot that takes up a lot of space or one bitcoin what do you think's more what do you think is the but, better yeah I, i'm gonna inject there because i actually did something similar i said it slightly different it's exactly what you said i'm just looking at the the analogy a bit differently so if there's only 21 million bitcoin and and we know that Eventually, not even now. And we look at, there's only two, th uh, there's only two million thousand ounce bars of silver. So one tenth as many, uh, you know, commercial bars of silver, which is the silver market, by the way. The silver market is determined on those thousand ounce bars, not on silver eagles or maples or wafers or any of that. So it's one tenth as big a supply. And one of those bars is worth about 28,000. Whereas a Bitcoin, I haven't checked today's price is 50,000. So roughly half of what a Bitcoin is worth, which is in the ether, so to speak, versus something that's used for almost everything in our modern lives. And it weighs about 70 pounds. Yeah. And it's one tenth as many of them, one tenth as many of them as there are Bitcoins. And Bitcoin is this very tight market, right? Yeah, exactly. So I think you answered that question. Um, okay, great. So then as far as like the miners go, I don't know if you noticed the, the last week because rates were rates were rising. So stocks, including silver miner stocks, were crashing. And I was just like, wow, what an incredible buying opportunity this is this, to get these these um, silver miners so cheap, especially when rates are rates are rising and the Fed is almost losing control. So do you see this as kind of an incredible buying opportunity on weakness whenever the miners kind of dip? It is. I mean, as long as my basic thesis is correct, we're going into a more inflationary environment or really more of a crisis economy. And the way you buy silver, you know, this at $5 an ounce is to buy the mining shares. And they are so undervalued relative to a very cheap silver price, inflation adjusted. So if you're really good stock picker, uh, you can pick up, you know, a basket of top tier, mid tier and juniors hold on, don't leverage or leverage very little what you could afford, no matter what happens, if it goes down further. And you should have, could have the right of your life. Um, there are opportunities in the, in the miners that uh, don't really exist anywhere else. I mean, a lot of people like the options market. I'm very big on the options market for call writing. The seller of options wins 85% of the time. That's a lot better odds than Las Vegas. So that's what I teach and doing my you know updates from time to time when we get that occasional oversold or overbought situation in the miners. So yeah, I really think now I want to add to that. Once this market takes off, and as I said a moment ago, maybe it's you know 33 and you know the LA Times start to feature it and you know. I'm back on CNBC or whatever. But uh, once that happens, then almost any miner with the word silver or gold in it is going to fly. So you really don't have to be much of a stock picker at that point. But what you do need to be is very cognizant of how markets work, because a lot of the, as Rick Rules famously said, the amalgamated moose pasture that's sitting in some 
weird place on the planet that really is a moose pasture only, but it's the all-star silver mine, you know, and there's about as much silver there as, you know, as in uh, my shampoo. Um, we'll sell because it's promoted. It says silver. It's cheap because people love cheap stocks. And if you know, really from the get-go what it is, I wouldn't say participate. I morally wouldn't do it. But that doesn't mean that you can't have the foreknowledge to uh, understand how that works. Yeah. And, you know, let's say we're smart and we sign up for the Morgan Report and you show us some of the high quality silver junior miners that you're a fan of. And we buy in summer, let's say, a hundred million dollar market cap today. And silver goes to, let's say, fifty dollars an ounce or sixty dollars an ounce, which is reasonable. What what do you think would happen to that junior miner? What kind of return would you expect? Yeah, well, I could go more from history. I mean, first of all, we can expect, well, I hate to say expect, but what I've seen in the past has been 10 bagger, 20 bagger, 30 bagger. So 30 times on your money, occasionally the 100 times on your money. So it just depends on, you know, how big is the deposit? Who's behind it? How real is it? How uh, tight is the float and what kind of buying pressure there is? So Kind of sweet spot has been in the past. If you have 35 million shares outstanding, 35 no more than 50, it's a well-known project backed by a major and everybody knows about it. You can see those stocks go from like 35 cents to $12. Yeah. And I've already seen kind of some of the action in these explorers that haven't found a thing. They just, I mean, they've just gone up like crazy, like, like, 50%, 20%. Celine, how, how, how would you advise trading around those, right? These well, those are tough. I mean, you know, some are real, some aren't. I call them story stocks. Sometimes the story is real. Sometimes it's partially real. Sometimes it's actually not real, but they always have a great story. It's a great thing that a cocktail party that I had this secret silver mine in Idaho that used to be this mine and now it's that mine and they pulled out this much silver in the past and blah, 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 blah. But you got to be very careful. So normally in those types of situations, first, you really have to understand what it is, what you're buying. And most people don't. It's cheap. That's all I know. So it's only three and a half cents. And look, I put in, you know, you know, some people put in like 10,000, 20,000 or something. And those. if you're a multi, 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 multi millionaire, then, you know, 20,000 might be reasonable. But if you're an average person, you're betting way too hard. Anyway. Those type of things we do, a, it's called a free ride. It's not my invention. I think Jim Dines is the first one I learned it from. It's very common in this industry, is when that stock doubles, sell half. So if you buy it at seven cents and it goes to 14, 15, sell half. Now you have what's called a free ride. You've got your capital back so you can buy another stock of amalgamated moose pasture and keep the one that you bought. It's only half as many shares, but you bought it for nothing, for nothing. And that's going back to the options thing I was talking about. That's a long-term call option that never expires on the silver market or gold market or, you know, whatever, lithium or whatever the resource stock is. I love that strategy of, of uh, selling half because it, it's always a good question. It's like, you're going you're gonna to ask it long-term, but you've doubled your money. And it's like, <laughs> I mean, do you really want to risk that, you know, that, that beautiful return you just had and potentially see a 50% drawdown, but... That, that's that's a great way to play something. Well. There were people in the uh, first run up in the early 2000s to say 2006 that had 10,000 in the market and became millionaires. And a lot of them did basically that strategy. And just about everything that had a good name was flying. It wasn't, a, you know, these people believe that they were great stock pickers. They're not in a really big, hot market. I mean, it's like any of these markets are good overdone. Tech wreck, the Japanese stock market. I'm old enough for that one of kind of the housing sector. You see it happen again and again and repeat in different sectors. And this one is no different when kind of the big question that you already asked is, well, will it happen again? And the answer is yes. And that's why David Smith and I wrote the book, Second Chance, How to Profit from the Coming Gold and Silver Shockwave. Because the last leg up, as I explained, 90% of the move in the last 10% of the time, we've started that as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, exactly. So that's why, you know, buying a basket and maybe, maybe, yeah, because a diversified basket will never go bankrupt, right? And it, it, if it gets cheaper, that's great. You can buy it, but it's pretty rock solid, right? So um, in doing that, you can probably put a lot more money than you would in a, in a junior. And I mean, that seems like a pretty great trade, like you're saying 10,000 or a, bi a big chunk of the portfolio in a basket, right? 
Right. The other thing I like to do is take a stalwart, like a royalty company. We'll just take Franco. I own it. And so I bought it, I think, around the $19, $20 level. It's been as high as like 150 It's backed off considerably. But, you know, when it gets overextended, you can write a covered call. So let's say you pick up $10,000 on that and you rented your stock for one month or two months. You can take that 10000 and buy, you know, 10 juniors or five juniors, you know, put in 1000 or 2000 each. Is it free? Mm, I don't know. You can ana- analyze that yourself. Basically, you rented your stock. You got ten grand. You put it into some juniors. And um, all you do is rent your stock. And you didn't get called out. Yeah, sounds good to me. So um, in the last few minutes, just could you speak a little bit to the industrial demand? Because a lot of people think of silver as kind of a speculator's asset where the where the price is subjective. And, you know, people might point to uranium or uh, oil and say, oh, no, no, this is the demand of oil. The price has to go up. But silver is more crazy. So can you just speak a little bit to the industrial demand and how it's um, how it is a real there's a real supply and demand dynamic? The trend for uh, industrial demand of silver is uh extremely strong. Yes, it ebbs and flows. And with the illness, it was curtailed somewhat. But if you go back 20 years, two decades ago, 35% of the silver market was industrial demand. So roughly one third. Today, it's one half. 20 years ago, we only mined about 550 million ounces of silver. Today, we mine about 800 million ounces of silver. So we're mining, we're taking about 50% of the mining activity, which is 400 million ounces. So think of it, you got, you know, your listeners or viewers like a stock buyback program. What if your stock buyback program was buying 50% of the float out of the market every year? What do you think that'd do to the share price? That's great. Yeah. And it's off the market essentially once it goes into the iPhones and the EVs and everything. And that's what I love about it. It's in the futuristic industries, right? It's the, the stuff that's really growing and 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 it'll keep growing. So, well, there's ones that would wipe out the silver market in theory. I always want to add in theory, but I mean, if you use maglev trains across the country, if you uh, did superconductivity throughout the world, or if you put everybody on solar, you'd wipe out all the silver easily. You wouldn't have enough. Wow. Yeah. See, it's, that's amazing. And and I like to think sometimes, like if, as a long term investor, fifty years down the line. Um, and just think of like a dystopia, like Blade Runner, right? And just some like how much all the silver is going to be just torn out of the ground by then, I would think, or at least a huge amount. And the demand just going to keep growing till with the electrification of everything. You know, I think the movie Looper got it right. I mean, you know, as a metaphor and in that movie, if you haven't watched it, you might want to rent it. But it's about uh, the future, China being the lead and the, the purpose of silver and gold, keeping the long term wealth intact. Absolutely. So. You know, we're, we're, we're out of time now, but where can people go to learn more from you and, you know, hear more about this? Well, it's been a lot of fun. Yeah, go to uh, themorganreport.com. It's themorganreport.com. Just get on our free service. You know, I will uh, send you some good information. I do a podcast by myself every week. I do a podcast with other guests from time to time. And um, we do occasional advertising, but not very much. Usually it's pretty rich content for free. This discussion is for informational purposes only. Nothing in this discussion should be taken as investment advice. Guests are not compensated for their appearance. Do not base any investment decisions on the information presented.